Good afternoon, everyone. It's Monday, December 7th. I'm tuning in to share with you my Sunday message from yesterday, from the second Sunday of Advent. For those who were perhaps out of town or, or who were at home, or at least if you were able to join us for a Mass, you perhaps did not have a chance to hear my message at one of the Masses that I preached at. Um, to begin with, I would just revisit the framework that I used last week because my mind is still working along those lines, having to do with the idea of what effective and powerful preaching actually entails. Uh, it's not how many jokes you tell to engage the audience. It's not the time limit, you know, turning in a seven or eight minute homily for those who like to watch the clock. It's not even about whether or not your homily was engaging or educational or whether it competed with the internet or video games or TV or your data devices. No, none of those things. The, the very high bar of effective preaching, at least in my opinion, and as I was taught, is that it accomplishes this. It is able to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. It is needs to work as a catalyst to bring about change in your life. Those most powerful homilies perhaps don't get a compliment at the end of Mass. In, in fact, in some cases, it may send people home a bit disturbed. This is how Jesus preached. If you look at the Gospels, he comforted those who were poor and disabled and persecuted and for his persecutors, for his critics. He had harsh words that challenged them to grow, to change the way that they were thinking. It's what we see on display in today's readings as well, by the way. The first reading from Isaiah literally comes from the 40th chapter uh, from a section of, the, of Isaiah called the Book of Consolation. And the opening words to it in this consoling piece is, Comfort, O comfort my people. Speak tender words to them. That's because Isaiah's audience was afflicted. Whereas if you look at the gospel, this is John the Baptist, a voice crying out in the desert, and he is very clearly afflicting people. He's telling them they're not living right, that they need to repent, that they, they need to prepare a way for the Lord to come because they're not on the right path. So you see those on display and uh, the best of preachers can at times um, make it into that territory to help the flock to grow. But even if uh, preachers fail in this task, I pointed out that the, the living word of God in and of itself has that power, it has that ability. And I found it kind of fascinating, therefore, to really reflect on this idea and realize that in a crowd of people, different individuals could hear the exact same words and have a completely different reaction to them. For instance, I gave us an example last week, the core words of the Saturday morning mass before the first Sunday of Advent, the words were from God. They were, I am coming. Now, if you are living according to God's plan, and particularly if you're living with heavy crosses, if you've suffered uh, and are desperate for help and are running out of energy and running out of hope, to hear the words, I am coming, it's like a life preserver being thrown to you. It's a great relief. It's a great consolation. And I shared an example of... Uh, a woman whose funeral I celebrated just a couple of days ago, who in her final days lost her home in the Alameda fire, uh, discovered that she had terminal cancer from a doctor and that it was already late stage four cancer that there was no treatment for. She had lived faithfully in her life and she used the time to just express an openness to God to say whatever comes I'm ready. And she died a beautiful death. She realized, I think, in her final days that those kinds of things that would normally plague people with stress or anxiety, for her, it's, it's kind of like God telling her, you don't need to worry about those things. 
and uh, she died a beautiful death with her family around her. And she experienced the kind of peace and consolation that the world doesn't know. Sometimes, however, uh, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, if we're a procrastinator and we think I'll get around to living a better life before I die, but suddenly uh, that day comes and you're not ready, like a thief in the night, panic can set in. I gave the example in last week's video of my sister telling me that she was dropping in to see me on a week that I really hadn't been doing very good housekeeping. Um, but after Sunday, another example came. So not only does uh, the state of a person's soul affect the way you hear these words, either as a consolation or as an affliction, but uh, your sense of faith as well. I, the example I gave on Monday was that famous passage about the shoot that springs up from the stump of Jesse. For us who are Christians, especially for those of us who know the end of the story, we know the Messiah came as our Savior, the incarnation happened, the greatest miracle that God ever did. And we know this passage is a prophetic reference of that great, great miracle. For us, it brings Christmas joy. It brings consolation. But I said, try to imagine hearing those words for the first time as a Jew in that moment, because it refers to the stump of Jesse. It refers to a tree being cut down. It refers to what seems like an undoing of God's promise that he said David and someone in his line would reign forever as long as they kept his word. And now we are hearing through the prophet that the tree of Jesse is going to be cut down. And ultimately that is, what happened, the people lost the Holy Land. One of the children of the king's line was smuggled out of the city, and that's how David's line was preserved till the time of Jesus. But for the rest of the family, the king was dragged out of the city, and his entire family was executed before his eyes, the ones who were still there. And last of all, he was blinded, so that the last thing that he could remember seeing in this life would be the death of his whole family. That is not a consolation. If you're a Jew living in that time, it is a great, great affliction. So where we are in our faith life, where we are in our walk with the Lord affects our hearing. And uh, I said that in my view, we could continue to apply this thinking to the words of John the Baptist. When he talks about preparing a way for the Lord, filling in the valleys and knocking down the mountains. If you have reached a point where you're fed up with your own efforts and have reached dead end after dead end and are tired of getting the same failed results, perhaps you could be in a place where to hear that challenge, that word of invitation could be seen as a, a joyful experience. However, if you are clinging to sin in your life and you don't want to embrace change, then you're not going to hear those words joyfully. The example I gave is St. Augustine, who famously wrote in his diary, in his confession, uh, a prayer from his younger years where he said, Lord, make me chaste, but not today. He wasn't ready for that change yet. For him, in that point of his life, hearing an invitation to repent or be converted, it's not a good thing. So based on that theme then, my challenge to you and my model for this Advent, the one I'm working on is this, joy is in the ear of the hearer. Let's try to live our life in such a way this Advent season that we can hear this invitation for conversion, for repentance, for the coming of the Lord, and in preparation for him as a joyous thing rather than an affliction. That's the goal. And more specifically, I would suggest this. Uh, metaphorically, the valleys that John the Baptist is speaking of, these are those areas of our life where we have failed to do good. The, the sin of omission, what we failed to do, there are big gaps there. We need to take a look at where those gaps are and maybe just choose one to fill in. And the mountains, those are structures of sin. 
that we've allowed to creep into our life that stand as obstructions between us and God. And we need to cut ties with some of those. We need to knock those down. I know it's overwhelming to take on too many of those tasks all at once, though. So I suggest just pick one structure of sin to knock down and one area of inactivity to fill in, to build up. And we will be beginning the work of John the Baptist in his challenging invitation. And if we take that on and we allow our hearts to be open to change, then I think we will be entering into the joyful spirit of the Advent season. That is my hope for you. That's my prayer for you. Let's join in that work together uh, to work on being joyful hearers and to prepare the way for the Lord. God bless you and we'll see you next week.